Okay, so almost everything that we know about how our brains uh, learn to function uh, comes from these types of paradigms. The baby is sat, you know, almost always on their own um, in front of a computer screen or a loudspeaker where we're playing information at them, yeah? So what are the key differences between uh, the real world um, and the settings in which we currently study uh, brain and behavior development? Okay, uh, this is important because it's the getting the question right to start with that informs what type of answer we receive. If we ask the wrong question, uh, then the, que the answer we're going to get is never going to be useful. Okay, so we're going to start with the simple distinctions, and then we're going to get onto the more subtle things. Okay, so the first and more obvious, most obvious way in which experimental tasks um, are different to the real world is that they're simpler. Yeah. So to give an example, this is a gaze following task. Uh, where an actress looks down for, I think it's exactly 4,000 milliseconds, and then looks up at the screen, exactly 8,000, I think, and then looks down at one of the two objects um, for exactly 4,000 milliseconds, yeah? Um, so this is an example of gaze following, which is thought to be an important social behavior, yeah? When children do this simplified experimental version, they do gaze follow. So they're significantly more likely to look to the one that she's looking at compared to not. There's actually quite a lot of studies suggesting now that when you look in a naturalistic setting, as close to an equivalent as possible, a task playing with their parent across a table, they don't actually gaze on it. So this is a really, really important theoretical thing. So th if they can do it in a super, super, super simplified experimental version, but they don't actually do it in the real world, what does that mean? So that's one difference between how we measure experiments in the real world. There are more fundamental ones, which I'm getting on to. Okay? So... The first, the next one is that the ways in which we, the things that we measure brain function relative to, yeah, a lot of the time they don't actually exist in a real world setting. So take, for example, an ERP, so an evoke response response potential, yeah, um, those are generally in a visual domain, at least, linked to the moments where a picture flashes on and off out of nothing, yeah, and you literally cut out the brain response relative to the first few milliseconds after this picture appeared, yeah. This isn't something our brains ever have to do in the real world, yeah? It's virtually unheard of that we're in a completely darkened situation and then something just flashes up out of nothing, yeah? Uh, so again, you know, what's the point in measuring the brain response to something when it's not something that our brains actually have to do in real world settings? Another kind of more fundamental um, uh, problem is uh, that the ways that we're measuring uh, brain function in these experimental tasks is all about a one-way flow of information, yeah? It's a one-way flow of information from the screen to uh, the child, yeah? Uh, whereas in fact, there's a lot of evidence now that that's not how learning works. Learning is about a bi-directional exchange of information, yeah? Um, how you uh, kind of, you, the baby generates experience through their actions, yeah? It's not just the case that, you know, as an experimental task, everything that we see and experience is determined by someone else, yeah? This is a really, really fundamental widespread uh, thing. Yeah? because it's fundamental and widespread because it affects our whole attitude to how we study things like learning. Yeah, So most historically of the research into learning is all about how stuff happens outside us and we just we, we passively perceive that in the real world. Yeah, uh, But in fact, uh, that's not how we interact with the real world. We generate experiences through our behaviours. Yeah, What I do determines what information reaches my sensory organs. Yeah, And that's the type of thing that experimental paradigms find it very, very, very hard to measure. There's also a really, really interesting uh, debate, you know, really interesting Derling paper on this. Uh, this is a great Pessoa paper that I put at the bottom, which talks about this, you know, about this whole idea of if we start from the mental operation and design an experimental task to, you know, come up with a simulacrum of kind of what the brain is doing during this mental operation, you know, is that actually a valid way to approach studying the brain? Yeah. So something like the Stroop task where I'm getting someone to read the word blue and sometimes it, the word blue is in blue ink and sometimes it's in pink ink. Yeah. Does this type of paradigm really tap anything meaningful about, you know, what people say it is measuring, like inhibitory control and that type of thing? You know, and does inhibitory control as measured on those types of paradigms, you know, actually kind of tap meaningfully onto anything um, in the real world? Yeah. A lot of really, really interesting debate about this. Uh, for me, though, this is challenged kind of the whole approach of starting from a mental construct and then designing an experimental task to measure that construct. So what we do um, is we measure naturalistic uh, real world behaviors, you know, in ecologically valid um, home settings um, and kind of as kind of close to real as possible, you know, tabletop interactions with parents. So that's why I do naturalistic studies.